right now I see here in Palo Alto an opportunity that you have to create a system where you're managing your waste stream. And my dream is to see a, a facility that handles municipal waste, organic wastes, and they repurpose that for the highest use of everything that's brought in. And here you have the, the, the perfect uh, situation for a methane digester. You have a certain amount of, uh, of uh, uh, easily digestible products that can be put through that. Some of these things can be put into composting. Some of them are well suited for making into biochar. The, uh, the effluent that you're working with at your plant can be used on both ends of this. As John said, to soak some of these chars in to pick up more nutrients perhaps, or also in combination with, uh, with composting, which we, we do in our, our town. I live in Port Angeles, Washington. We have a composting facility it's the exact same situation. We have an old dump. It's been covered up. A transfer facility is there now. And um, uh, uh, we have a composting facility. One of the hurdles is, though, that in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, um, most of our management of trash and garbage is done by a few companies. And Usually this is done in long-term contracts and so you have the, the control of the waste of the municipalities in the hands of a few companies and there hasn't been real incentive for cross-connection and, and highest use of uh, all of these things that have been so easy for us to just give to somebody else to haul down the road. So. What I would like is to be able to offer that we could start a dialogue here in this town and bring the people that we work with who are talking about doing the exact same thing in Oregon um, to be able to give you uh, outside information about how this might be done right down the road here at, at this site. Um, it, it just seems made perfectly for it. So anyway, that, that's my dream. I, I, had, uh, I had hoped to uh, um, see these sorts of things evolve in our landfills around the Pacific Northwest. I, I'd hoped to be able to see uh, uh, portions of these properties created to uh, uh, manufacture um, uh, microremediation treatments to clean up toxic soils. Right now, most of toxic soils in most areas, they get dug up, hauled off. We don't need to do that. We don't have to dig them up, send them down the road, pay hundreds of dollars a ton in tipping fees. We can clean them up right where they are with stuff that we can make from our own environment where we live. And, and virtually, I, I believe that we can take care of all of our problems right where we live. And, and this is the kind of dialogue I'd like to start. So I'd like to, I'd like to have uh, this be interactive tonight a little bit more. And, and these groups tend to be really eclectic when uh, uh, we meet and talk about biochar. And they tend to be represented just like you people are. We have people that are interested in, in uh, gardening. We have people who are uh, scientific background and uh, people with local interests. And I'm particularly interested in, in what you might have to say about uh, your facility down the road and uh, and what you think about what you've heard tonight. With Palo Alto's facility, what we'd be looking at in terms of input materials would be the, the sewage waste stream and then uh, yard waste, which is currently composted, and then food waste. Um, and the model that um, we've been kind of looking at lately has been that it would be like uh, digestion of the sewage and the food, and then composting of the digestate uh, and the uh, yard waste. And um, so I'm wondering if, if, if you had control over it, what would be your process flow? Would you be generating compost? I mean, would you be generating biochar from any of the digestate leftovers, when I, the, the leftover material yeah. from the digestion, or would you 
I, I hear, hear you saying uh, passing some of the nutrients through to biochar. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm wondering what that. Yeah, I, I don't think it's e either or. I, I think it's rather and, and uh, and I know that uh, um, as you look at your biomass, a certain amount of it is better suited for composting, and a certain amount of it will be better suited for making biochar. And this really needs to be done by assessing these volumes and comparing them, and then looking at what their highest use is and what it would cost to have a plant to be able to handle the volumes, volumes that you'd need to handle for each process. But I, I don't see them as mutually exclusive, but rather something that would be uh, joined together. One of the thing, one of the materials we've been working with is the digeste off the methane digester. It's very useful uh, when you carbonize it. It's, um, so we take the digestate off of the digester, pelletize it, and then I carbonize it. And in fact, that was a material that was used in Howard's study to clean up the PAHs and the, and the hydrocarbons. Um, so, and then if you're looking at a composting facility, you know, the, the, just the odor can be mitigated quite readily by the use of char. Um, and what that means is that the, the sulfurs and the and the ammonias that are generally produced are actually getting impregnated into the char. And be making it more value, valuable yeah. as a nutrient at the same time. So, you know, the unique thing about your plant right down the road here is the proximity that it sits at to some pretty valuable property. We're, you know, we can almost hit it with a rock right now. And, uh, and so imagine having a facility like that that is uh, odorless, and, and this is the kind of thing that biochar could be used for down there. Um, yeah, go ahead. So you're saying, I, I was wondering about this, if you do environmental cleanup with the biochar, mm -hmm. then you've got this, you know, high zinc compound or cadmium, whatever, but you're saying you that's not necessary. yeah, it's not, you don't yeah, have to. That, the, that's a really good question, and, and John's been working with, uh, with uh, these socks that are filled with biochar that are taking runoff run from uh, roofs and, and parking areas. And so far, uh, we haven't seen these things get loaded up uh, to where they're, they're not useful. Um, we don't know what, how, how fast they're gonna get loaded up completely at this time, but, but I can say that there is an immobilizing uh, 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 factor that's involved when you're use, using this stuff and it, in a remediation environment right now you, you manage uh, the decision-making process about how you're going to go about cleaning up a property or, or uh, water according to a, to a couple of things one one is of course the the, uh, the danger to the environment and the toxicity uh, another is the end use of the property and then the third are choices that are based on uh, comparisons of cost and so forth well one one system that you see uh, in use is uh, uh, one of immobilizing toxins and um, if you can do that and make them less bioavailable uh, this might be something where you do one treatment and forget about it uh, in the case of things that tend to become uh, uh, loaded over time, um, I suspect we'll probably find some threshold there sometime. But we haven't seen it yet. That's, that's one of the studies we're doing is it was called breakthrough curves. Um, so that we're loading up the material. I just, I, I, we're not done with it yet. So we're starting, we're loading up with toxins to its point where we can't fill it up anymore. And then we're looking at what the, it takes to extract a fully saturated char. At this point, the chars that we're using in the environment and then extracting before we've reached maximum, um, it's quite difficult actually to remove the, the, the metals back off. Um, and it's nothing that would occur in the environment. It, we're using high molar acids or, or very alkaline materials to do that. Well, it sounded like you said that <coughs> these actually enhance a fertilizer type properties. I mean, yeah, if you can't really get them back out, then well, um, what, what, what I fertilizer. think, yeah, so there's different mechanisms, I think. Um, the, the, the nutrients that we're seeing for fertilization, um, you know, I'm not, you know about the, more about the mycorrhiza. I mean, there's something else going on there to, to extract the, the, the phosphorus yeah. is still bioavailable. 
in a bioavailable form, the phosphorus is. The nitrogen, um, some of it is still bio, bioavailable, some of it isn't, um, just inherent to the way it was, was, was bound up. Um, that's something I need to understand more of, of exactly what's going on with the nitrogen cycle there. Um, so when we're looking at compost, certainly the phosphorus is, is still bioavailable and, and some of the nitrogen is still bioavailable. Um, some of it's going to get bound up. But what I do know is you're not fluxing NOx mm -hmm. off. You know, you're, there's not N2O going up into the atmosphere anymore from that system. One of the things you mentioned was the relationship to batteries. If you have yeah. a high concentration of zinc and cadmium slurry, that's an electrode. Uh, well, it is paramagnetic <laughs> material. You can take, it, yeah. it, it does have paramagnetic qualities, absolutely. You can put a, a lot of the chars that I, I should have put a picture in there, but um, you can put a magnet underneath of it and it will form up. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you, you know, that, that, is, that is very interesting. And, and, and that's it, uh, a, uh, an, a way of thinking about uh, a soil, one a way that I think about soil is sometimes I, I refer to it as a living sea of metabolites. And you can make, you can use all kinds of big words to describe soil. And as you peer more deeply into the chemistry of it, at some point, depending on the type of chemist you are, you're going to talk about them with different words. And some people are going to talk about them with words that, that have to do with the, the electrical nature of these reactions. And, uh, and one thing that, that is interesting, acid soils, where you have a lot of this stuff going on, tend to be more productive. Um, they also tend, like where, where we live, we have a lot of rain, that, that nutrients tend to leach out of them quickly too. That, that one of the descriptions of biochar that a, a colleague of mine started using years ago was, he would say, well, think of it as kind of as, as a battery in the soil. You put this stuff in the soil, nutrients come by, they stick to it, they adsorb onto it, they hang onto it for a while, then the microorganisms that are living in there uh, digest some of that stuff and it leaches out. Um, one of the uses for chars that, that uh, uh, I am uh, working with a farmer on in eastern Washington right now has to do with land that, that the relationship between Productivity of land and and the type of cropping that's done has to do ultimately with whether or not you can afford the water. And this is sandy property here. Uh, we're going to put include char in there just to see if it will uh, increase the water retention over time there. So the word's out right now. Check in in a year. You know, I, one thing I wanted to, to talk with you about is uh, 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 management of dairies. And, and in the county close to where I live, the small dairymen are, are being pointed at by the Department of Ecology right now. And um, depending on what county you live in, in the state of Washington, Stormwater is managed differently. In most areas, it's managed for turbidity. Just if it's clear, it's okay. If it's not clear, you're in trouble if it's coming off your property. Um, in this particular county that I'm talking about, um, it's managed according to uh, tracking coliform bacteria. So, you know, just imagine as a dairyman, you being able to take your waste stream, turn part of it into biochar, and then use biochar as a way of uh, uh, mitigating off-site contamination due to runoff where your, uh, your cows are. Um, it's, it's something that is worth considering. Um, I, I wonder about using it as a potential protection for listeria. This might be a good experiment for, for somebody to do at some point. Besides the uh, electrolytic uh, electrode aspect, I think one of your charts showed a shift in pH from acetic to alkaline yeah. as well, and that seems to be another whole fertile area for examining when you change the pH by a large number, the, the corrosive effects of low pH, highly acetic compounds versus moving toward the alkaline to mix with other compounds, because we tend to have too much yeah. acetic stuff around, and you're creating stuff that's got extra alkaline 
So that it seems like this is another byproduct that could be mixed with a bunch of things, oh, yeah. including it's a fertilizer. It's a lining agent. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we can manipulate the pH. I, I can make you know, chars through the process, we can manipulate it from just above neutral to, I've made them up to 12. So, yeah, you can get quite alkaline. That's great. I mean, there are so many chemical reactions. It's, it's hard to get enough alkaline stuff. So, so yeah. I mean, there's a balancing act in nature. We've got like too much acid stuff and not enough alkaline. Mm -hmm. You have a mechanism that could produce designer alkalites. <laughs> Yeah. Wow, and you could create new kinds of stuff. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. If one of the benefits of biochar is better water retention, why aren't the folks in the Central Valley just clamoring for it? They have a real expense in, in getting enough water. I think they will after this gentleman's uh, uh, conference this summer. <laughs> World. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, that's what I, it's, I think it's not so. broadly known, and and the water the water retention um, desertification benefits of biochar are some of the studies because those are long term studies. So some of that's just starting to come out more. Um, there's some been some studies in Texas that have shown some real uh, potential for drought remediation with the biochars and. Um, you know, it's, it's the same things, that the, the reasons we, we like charcoal in our filters, it's, it does all the same stuff in the soil, and it keeps, it just holds stuff and keeps it there until the plants can use it. So it's, it's got some real benefits. Um, one of the other thing, qualities about the biochar is because it's not consumed um, by the microbes over time, it, it, the productivity um, benefits actually in some studies will increase over time. So it isn't, unlike fertilizer, yeah. sometimes it's talked about as a fertilizer, but it's really more of a fertile, fer fertilizer catalyst. So as the microbes take, um, take residence in the systems and the, the nutrient exchanges start happening, the um, productivity ranges can increase quite substantially. There was this study in, I think, Columbia, Summer in that region where the, f the first year there was no um, productivity benefit, in the second year they got 25% increase, and the third year they got 45% increase. And so it, it kept getting more and more and more yeah. productive instead of less and less. And that's another reason to put it into a compost <coughs> regime is because it, there's a lot of artificial aging that will take place in that environment. You know, th they'll see a lot more of those acids and those microbes <coughs> in that environment that over time in the soil it takes to build up. And so that's another benefit of like the co-use of those two things is because of the, the, what we're calling artificial aging. It'll, it'll put some more activation energy basically into the char. I got another question. I'm a physicist, not a chemist. Mm -hmm. are, there, are there any reactions where pulling the carbon out liberates hydrogen can, because if you could do that, then you could make fuel cells. Oh, um, certainly, I mean, hydrogen, I can make hydrogen pretty, r relatively rich hydrogen gas, you know, um, especially if I include oxygen in the process of the carbonization. So, um, So maybe one of the industries that you might be able to go on to is the transportation industry, because they need batteries and fuel cells. Palo Alto is actually the right place to do it. We've, we've got Tesla here. <laughs> right. I'm trying to figure it out. You know, the car costs fifty, sixty, or seventy thousand dollars depending on how much batteries you have. <laughs> Seriously, it drives either 160 miles, 240, or 320 miles. It's either 50, 60, or 70k depending on the amount of battery. Could you imagine if you could be contributing to the, you know, electric cars by derivative products of this process? That would be incredible. Be fantastic. Well, you know, an interesting aspect of the of the. Uh, biochar research community is that uh, uh, some people are looking to this as forming uh, bio oils that could be used as either additions or instead of, of uh, uh, diesel uh, for uh, uh, both uh, the boiler technology as well as for engines. And um, you, you know, there's a lot of ways we can go with this stuff, and that's one of, one of the things that's so exciting about this. And, and 
this this particular diagram is one that that the idea of it came from a, a guy that uh, that lives not far from me, and I, I added to it a little bit, and uh, uh, I call it the biochar planetary gear. I don't know how many of you are mechanics sitting out there, but this is a planetary gear set. You find these in transmissions, and the centered one is supposed to be biochar, and for every interest group in this room, one of you can pick one of these gears as your area of interest, and biochar touches them all. It touches agriculture down here. It builds the soil tilt, water retention, fire danger, nutrient capture. In the environment, this, which is where I use it, I, yeah, initially I was looking for something that I, that I could uh, grow fungi on that would maintain its structure because uh, uh, a lot of times when you get done with, with a contaminated soil, it's going to be used as fill, that's structural fill. It's a road's going to be sitting on top of or a building, and uh, uh, um, uh, you shouldn't have a lot of, of, uh, of organic materials in there. It should be really structural. One thing I found out about this stuff is that certain fungi like it better than others. And uh, one of the things that John was just talking about there of, of composting at first as an ingredient in compost so it has these living organisms in it. Certain organisms have an affinity for char, and, uh, and in soil science, uh, in uh, fire soil science, <coughs> people have been looking at charcoal in soil forever. And I can remember a botany uh, a professor in college uh, walking out in the woods with him, and he would go, look at that, Howard, there was a fire here. And you would see a piece of charcoal in the middle of an old growth forest. So. Um, it, it's always been a part of our environment, and it's interesting now that we're looking at a brand new old technology that seems to have uses in all of these different areas. It's, it's very exciting, um, and, and I, I hope it takes hold in all of our communities. Um, for me, um, you know, we, we talk about having epiphanies every now and then in life, and, and I think the first epiphany I ever had was one where I really felt comfortable in life, and it was finding myself out in nature one time and knowing I was home. And an epiphany happened to me in this subject last year when I finally got it that this stuff, carbon, affects us in all of these ways and that it's important to think about it. And, and this greenhouse gas reduction, it seems impossible to think that we could turn anything backwards, but we gotta try. And this is one way to try it. There's only a couple ways. The other way is growing an old, old growth forest. If we, do we have that kind of time? <laughs> Biochar, we can start taking carbon out right now. So, so Let's say that the technical issues got worked out and the economics sort of justified itself. Here in Silicon Valley, we're kind of like in the innovation business. And one of the things that helps innovation happen is the ability to tell innovation stories. Because innovations are more embraced as a function of how much they're communicated. The guy at that table, Matt, who was sitting over there, is a documentary filmmaker. And he was here sort of poking around like, is there a story I could tell here? And as I look at this particular slide, this would be a great slide for a home page because yeah. it really sums up the whole story in a single image which could be clicked upon and you can go off in the path of yeah, any one of those. Are. Where are you in, what are you interested in? There it is. That's so, I so I think there's a storytelling aspect and the way in which stories are told are partially political. And since you're talking about aligning yourself with other sorts of activities like the land that you guys worked on, Prop there's certain stories have more legs than other stories. Mm -hmm. And by being connected to a high visibility, high profile kind of activity, like a Prop like an electric car, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. a biomass, um, you could probably get it adopted faster. And I'm wondering if everybody's thinking about the science and the money, or if there are other people in this biochar movement thinking about, how do you tell a strategic story so that the appropriate alignments occur to deliver the message more quickly? And so here, in, there's a lot of software industry in Silicon Valley, and they're in software development right now, they 
called agile software development. And there's a concept called, I was telling you guys before, the, the minimum shippable product. Mm -hmm. So software developers here, they create a piece of code, they throw a product out there, it's pretty crummy, they ship it. They get to a giant feedback loop with the marketplace because people try it, they give them feedback, they keep them going through more generations of it. So I think there is probably a way for you to have a minimum viable story where you could deliver it in a, lo a lot faster amount of time. <coughs> this is very, very powerful stuff. But to digest the, the hour and a half, two hours worth of stuff down into you know, the three to five minute video that's on your homepage that shows the gears turning around, uh, I'm just wondering about that part of it because this seems like you already have more evidence than plenty of industries have when they start and that it's time for marketing to step in and rip the product out of the hands of the engineers and ship it, even in an imperfect form. And maybe that's what you're doing by delivering these samples to different people who try to use it. But being an engineer myself, I never think anything's done. I always want to perfect it more and more yeah, and more. Exactly. And then the, the perfect becomes the enemy of the good because I never get it good enough yeah. or I never get perfect enough. So some sales and marketing guy has to come into my lab and rip it out of my hands and say, I'm shipping this sucker because I already sold it and I got 10 customers who are ready. So I'm wondering if there's that kind of force I, applying I actually, to you guys. I actually come from a marketing background, so mm -hmm. that's Great. my interest. I, yeah. I, I love all the scientific stuff, I can, I can get it. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm looking for is how to translate that into digestible pieces that exactly. average folks can, can understand. So, um, so I, absolutely, and I, and I do think that's exactly where we're at. Mm -hmm. the, the science has to continue. There are some big questions, there's lots of little questions, all of that needs to still be addressed, but there is enough, and it's substantial enough that we can start moving forward and we can actually start building yeah. an industry. And talking about adoption, talking about um, distribution, all, all of those things. And there's, an, there's, so, there's such a breadth here that it doesn't have to be a big industry story, but it can be. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a backyard story, but it can be. It doesn't have to be an organic farmer story, but it can be. So I think trying to find the one is, 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 is not the way to go because it's gonna limit the, the um, adoptability of this. So it's a matter of finding the audience and finding the story for each audience and then, and then going with that and, that and not trying to say, um, but if, it's not an either or question. It's really a, how can we adopt this on, on a broad area in a lot of different directions concurrently. I have an idea about this and, and it, it relates to something you said a, a few minutes ago, Howard, you brought up the point is, is the EPA interested in this? And you went on to say, that uh, uh, what would it take to get this stuff accepted? Well, there is a process, and the process is related to what you're talking about, and it's about the, the ability of an engineering firm to represent a community to incorporate materials like this into stormwater treatment features like what John has helped develop and do it legally, and in Washington, Believe it or not, the acronym for the process is called TAPE. And the word red would go real well before <laughs> it, but TAPE is a manual that is uh, written that will uh, instruct a person how to go through a process with the Department of Ecology to be able to get certification of one of two types to use new products in features like this. And they have a conditional use or an accepted practice. Sometimes these things end up being called BMPs, which used to mean best management practice. Today, it's actually the item. What we need is teaming with groups of people who can bring in their strengths to the discussion to be able to uh, go through the processes of this tape program and, and uh, uh, qualify uh, products and then take that to engineering companies that are eager to try out new things but only with no risk. They have to be something that's already been developed. Um, the type of work that, that I've been doing in most uh, of my uh, uh, last 15 years has been uh, uh, focused on the remediation industry and it's been self-funding development and that's a hard way to go. 
um, what we need to do is build teaming between us. Focus on a project. It might be one stream. Uh, these talks that, that I give in other communities, I've been asked, well, if you had a half a million bucks, what would you do with it? And I say, when I'm home, one salmon stream. That's what I would do with it. I would clean up one salmon stream. So, as you pointed out, I forgot your name, I'm sorry. What? Charles. Charles. As Charles has pointed out, it's not an either or proposition, it's really a both. So then maybe what the story is here is a meta story. It's a story that's above all the stories because I've been an innovator for 40 years, and I can't think of anything that applies to this many different worlds. It's amazing. Uh, so, so that's a story in itself. It's a, it's a very universally applicable, fundamental type of thing. And that's the either or. It's, it's, it's the both. Right. There's the meta story as proven by a couple of sub-stories in, in a couple of different areas. Right, and that's, that's why I was trying to mention before that the idea of the killer app is to pick one of those and then, and then run with it, but you lose a lot of the power of the, the system's benefit of looking at this and how it touches up in a positive way and so many different things. That's a bigger story, and you lose it if you just talk about one, one channel. That's why I like this slide. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's a biotech film coming out this summer. Um, oh, really? Yeah, that was produced by Jeff Wallen of Eco Technologies oh, okay, sure. Group. Yeah. And um, it'll be coming out this summer at the uh, conference in Sonoma. And it's trying to tell the meta stories. So they in went around the world and, and interviewed a bunch of different biochar experts. And uh, there's a main character in the story, Biochar Bob. <laughs> um, who is a 18 year old um, that's very into biochar, so it's trying to kind of bring in the youth movement into it. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it. The first cut should be out in a couple months. So. So now I see why you're interested in follow up, but this is an ideal community. It really is. Yeah. Right? You, you had a question earlier? Did, did it get uh, answered? Yeah, it was just in terms of. Uh, uh, I was thinking if it, it do you think that if uh, we were making biochar from say the woody materials and then maybe some of the um, uh, leftover digestate mm -hmm. would those end up being basically uh, funneled into two different markets do you think not necessarily they, if they were combined they might be one they might be another though you know one it, a lot of this will depend on the machinery that's used to make it and in this, in this case down the road, uh, I think the perfect type of biochar machine would be one that would process pellets. And so the pellet process char might be something that would lean more toward the fiber content that's coming out of a digestion process than something that is uh, ground up and mixed in. But, but it could be used that way too. You know, going back to the the, uh, 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 when you first asked the question was about um, what is it either or with the char? Well, no, it would, it would need an assessment of, of what the materials are coming in in their highest use. The, the plant that we are uh, um, intending on co-locating with in Oregon is one that's using a variety of different biomass inputs in their digestion process. And it's a blend. It's not just manures. It's not just grass, but it's a blend of things. Could, could there be like a biochar substrate where there were other like biochar doping agents that had different properties that when you mixed those two different kinds of Absolutely. biochar together, so you could have the, the largest mass production of the substrate and then the additive biochars gave it different properties. Well, this is kind of what the oil industry has done. When you drive your tanker to a refinery down from Alaska, you stop at one, you go to another, you go to another, you go to another, and by the time that you arrive at where you're going, uh, the stuff has been blended into a product. And so, um, you know, this is common in, in, the, uh, in the carbon industry. There's the the different chars have what's called a different redox potential, so so it's reduction oxidation curves, and those curves can be manipulated, and they can serve. So, what we're looking at is being able to look at okay a characterization of, of chars and their redox potential, and that redox potential is going to have um, 
implications for environmental use. So if we look at a, at a suite of toxins, we can, we can manipulate that curve by looking at combining different chars or different materials so we can increase that curve or, or decrease it or expand it. So that's really, in the long run, it's, that's going to be this, um, as we understand the material more and more, we can design for a suite of, of purposes. So that just brings to mind an amazing thing. I, my wife's a potter, and they talk about reduction firings. Yeah. And in a kiln, yeah. I wonder if primitive kilns were using biochar to make pottery. Because, you, because the, uh, that may be where yeah, some of this natural... Make biochar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but biochar might have been a sure, byproduct yeah. Yeah. of firing pottery. Well, that's one of the things <laughs> you see in the terra preta soils is a lot of clay shards. Yeah. Yeah.